Hello, my name's Bev and I'm the author of the book Please Eat, A Mother's Struggle to Free Her Teenage Son from Anorexia, which describes our family's battle with the deadly eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, which my teenage son Ben developed back in 2009. Welcome to chapter 11, which is called CAMS. CAMS, if you remember, stands for Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. In late January, we finally get the long-awaited letter from CAMS with the date of our first assessment, 16th of February, much sooner than the April appointments we've been led to expect. But in the events, we never get there. A few days later, Ben is taken into hospital with the slow pulse rate described at the beginning of this book in the introduction. The dash to the first hospital, followed by the decision to move him by ambulance to the specialist cardiac unit in the city's other main hospital. I arrive in the other hospital to discover Ben undergoing more scans and tests. He is also hooked up to another machine and has an intravenous line inserted into a vein in his hand. A worried Paul arrives and I quickly take him to one side to explain what's been going on. Then, a bit later, an orderly brings in an early evening meal. Sorry, but you arrived too late to choose from the menu. She apologises to Ben. I hope this is okay. She deposits an unappetising plate of chicken, overboiled vegetables and watery gravy in front of him. Not surprisingly, Ben ignores it. In a panic, I have visions of wheeling in cauldrons of home-cooked food to keep him from starving. But for tonight, because, thank God, he is hungry, we'll have to settle for whatever the hospital shop has on sale. As I take the lift to the ground floor, I'm struck by the absurdity of it all. There is my son upstairs on the ward, wired up to cardiac machines and undergoing a host of frightening tests. Yet here I am heading for the hospital shop, more concerned about selecting the right kind of sandwich. Sometimes living with this illness can seem like a theatrical farce or one of those hilarious silent movies where everyone is dashing around like crazy. Only this screenplay isn't hilarious. It's terrifying. I choose a sandwich carefully, finally going for a tuna salad, which I hope and pray he will eat. I also select a fruit salad, some dried fruit and a banana. Ben, please eat it. Ben has anorexia, I explain back on the ward as someone removes the untouched chicken supper. I want them to get it, to urgently react by sending in a specialist SWAT team armed with mountains of life-giving food which they'll get Ben to eat. This is a hospital after all, damn it. But instead they look at me blankly. I have a sneaking suspicion they know even less about eating disorders than I do. This seems odd because already I'm aware that anorexia can affect the heart. After all, Ben's lost most of the visible muscle on his body, so goodness only knows what the illness is doing to that hidden muscle, the heart. Meanwhile, half of me panics with visions of cardiac arrests, heart transplants and worse. The other half thinks, well, if they're allowing him to eat, then they can't be thinking of operating. And he's at this end of the ward, and thankfully not that end, the emergency end. Also, he's not seeing the consultant until the next morning. If it was critical, he'd be seeing him now. Things like that. Unfortunately, at this stage, the doctors are unable to say what is wrong. Why does no one seem overly interested in his anorexia? My blood goes cold again. I simply have to accept that they're the professionals. They know what they're doing, or at least I hope they do. As Ben is taken downstairs for further tests, Paul and I take a break and head for a cafe in the local shopping centre. Paul places the chicken and bacon sandwich that I don't feel like eating in front of me. With any luck, this will shock Ben into seeing what he's doing to himself. Hopefully... It'll give him the wake-up call he needs, Paul says. 
I hope and pray so, vaguely aware of the people buzzing around us on the way home from work. Others going out for the evening. People laughing and chatting, some probably the same age as Ben, en route to a movie in the cinema upstairs. Later that evening, Paul and I leave the hospital for home. We're exhausted. Neither of us gets a good night's sleep. I'm up at 4am, head hurting, half wondering if I'll receive an emergency phone call. By 8am, we're back at the hospital. <clears throat> Thankfully, the consultant tells us when he does his rounds, Ben's heart has stabilised. It's still beating slowly, but not slowly enough to keep him in hospital for another day, and the various tests haven't showed up anything sinister. It's the first time we've met the consultant, and we're desperate to know if this problem is going to reoccur. After all, it's our child's heart we are talking about, and he only has one heart. We often find that athletes have slow pulse rates, he says, repeating what the doctor said at the first hospital. I understand Ben is very sporty, so in the absence of any other reason why his pulse is slow, I suspect this might be the cause. Ben has anorexia, I say again. He's had anorexia since the summer. Yes, he does a lot of sport, but the main problem is that he's not eating properly and has lost an awful lot of weight and muscle. Well, says the consultant to Ben, if you ever feel strange again, you must promise me you'll come straight back. Fat chance of Ben doing that, I think. On the way back to the car, Ben surprises us by wanting to stop off for something to eat. I'm starving, he exclaims, ordering a hefty-looking bagel and proceeding to devour it hungrily. A couple of years later, he tells me this is because he wanted to prove that he could conquer the illness without any outside help, and also because he wanted to cheer us all up. Being in hospital put the fear of God into me. I didn't want to repeat, he says. Within minutes of arriving home, I call Cams. I tell the person who answers the phone that Ben needs to be seen right away. Not in two weeks' time, but now, urgently. I tell them about the heart scare. I say he's lost one quarter of his body weight since the summer. I describe the rages. I leave nothing out. The person says she'll get someone to call me back. A few moments later, the phone rings. It's a consultant psychiatrist called Sarah. Would you like to bring Ben in to see us at nine o'clock on Monday morning? She says to my amazement and relief. So, four months after I first took Ben to see our GP, we are sitting in front of Sarah and a nursing specialist called Linda. My first impression of the CAMS unit isn't a good one. It's a small, shabby building located in one of our city's most deprived areas, surrounded by run-down high-rise council housing, litter-infested wasteland and dodgy-looking gangs of youths. It's the kind of area where you worry about leaving your car or walking after dark. We sit in the waiting area, which looks almost as cheerless as the exterior. High ceilings and shiny, windowless, institutional walls. A radio plays in the background, presumably in an attempt to make the room feel more welcoming. I glance at the notice, warning that no violence or abusive behaviour will be tolerated. I later discover this building used to be a 19th century workhouse. There's no one else in the waiting area except me, Ben and Paul until a smiling Sarah and Linda arrive on the scene, armed with files and clipboards. Ben is taken into an anteroom to be weighed, while Paul and I are directed into a featureless consulting room. Sarah apologises that the building isn't more welcoming. We sit down, the three of us opposite the two of them, with an ugly formica table in between. I notice a box of tissues on the table. They expect tears. There's a clock on the wall above Sarah's head. I will get to know this clock intimately over the following months, willing the hands to move slower as they creep further and further towards the end of our weekly 60 minutes. 
The rusting steel-framed frosted glass window doesn't fit, and on this early February morning, a cold draught blows across the thickly painted radiator to the cork notice board with its faded pictures. Outside, above the frosted pane of glass, I can see a high wall with patchy flaking render, and over that, the concrete stairs of some high-rise flats. It's noisy, with the sound of vehicles and people using this route as an exit from the main hospital or as a place to smoke. Sometimes we have to raise our voices just to be heard. Nothing in this dismal room will change in the two years we spend with CAMS. With its peeling paint, rounded institutional door frames and tall ceiling, it isn't unlike the kind of cheerless room you'd expect in a 19th century mental institution. But, I think to myself, I mustn't judge a book by its cover. Sarah leans forward in her chair. So how's the pulse rate behaving? She asks with concern. I say I'm not really sure, but I'm keeping an eye on it, timing it against my watch. So far it's still low, but not as low as it was. I explain that I'm worried sick that the problem might reoccur. I tell her that Ben has lost one quarter of his body weight since July and I'm terrified of where this is going. I can hear the pitch of my voice getting higher and faster as panic sets in. Meanwhile, Sarah and Linda sit there, calmly, listening to what I have to say. Red tape means there are lots of formalities, like form filling, signatures and so on. Just get to the bits where you make him well, I want to yell at them as my anxiety levels rise. Stuff the paperwork. Sarah explains that we'll be seeing them once a week for, for a 60 minute session, and Alice, a dietitian, once every three weeks. Sometimes we'll meet together as a family and at other times Ben will be seen alone by either Sarah or Linda or both. Really and truly it's impossible to say exactly what will happen or how long the treatment will take. It's more a case of playing it by ear, experimenting and seeing how things turn out. Experimenting? I don't know if I like the sound of that but despite my mounting panic I remind myself that it's not like a physical illness. You can't prescribe a course of medication and the patient recovers in a week. I get the feeling we're going to be coming here for some time. I take a deep breath and try to calm myself down, telling myself that we're finally with the experts. They will know what to do and how to do it. Suddenly I feel safer. We're the shipwrecked boat and there the air sea rescue team hovering overhead. I eagerly wait for them to hoist us from the sinking ship. A relaxed and genial Sarah asks more questions while Linda continues to scribble notes. We sign more forms and nod our heads as the legalities are explained to us. Then, in the blink of an eye, the assessment is over. No, I want to scream. We need more time. Absurdly, I'm convinced that the more time we spend with Sarah and Linda, the faster Ben will recover. I want them to do a cramming se session, military boot camp style, like the weight loss camp that takes over the school every summer where, in theory, obese teenagers arrive for an intensive six weeks and depart slim and healthy, problem solved. But far from being winched into the helicopter and flown to safety, nothing has changed. Back home, life carries on as normal, or at least the new normal we're reluctantly getting used to. Seven days later, we're back in that shabby room for a second assessment, listening to Sarah while Linda takes notes. Is this when they make him eat, I wonder? Where they wave a magic wand and, hey presto, via some magical persuasive technique, Ben agrees to cooperate and we all live happily ever after. I've just finished a book that insists you feed your anorexic teenager with three large meals a day and three snacks a day. Custard, sponge puddings, ice cream, jam, biscuits, cakes, burgers, chips, butter, cream. The more calorific and fat laden, the better. Yet nowhere in this book does it say how you're supposed to get this food into your child. So far I've failed to get the most normal foods into my son. 
I happen to hope in hell of getting him to eat steamed puddings, butter and cream. I can only assume that Cam's will show me how to do it. Soon, very soon. Impatiently, I wait for them to get on to the subjects of food. In the end, I interrupt. Will you be putting together an eating plan for Ben? Linda rummages in her briefcase and digs out a sheet of paper. This is the kind of thing we use, she says, handing me some photocopied sheets stapled together. Like the book, this eating plan expects pa the patient to eat three meals and three snacks a day, measured in 10-inch plate sizes and 250 milliliter cups. How many calories should he have in a day, I ask. We prefer not to count calories. We deal in portion sizes. The sheet describes what a portion is. Yet again, I'm faced with a long list of impossible foods in unworkable quantities. Unworkable for us at any rate. Jam or custard donut, sponge pie or crumble with custard and ice cream. Who are they kidding? Nevertheless, I take the sheet away with me, determined to have a go. I stop off at the supermarket and grab a large trolley. I push it around the aisles, zealously grabbing peanut butter, scotch pancakes, cheese, yoghurt, cookies, bread, bacon, jam, smoothies, full-fat milk. I am a mother on a mission. I can feel the adrenaline pumping through my system. It's like one of those TV game shows where you have just seconds to pack as much food as possible into your trolley. It's almost as if, by the very action of cramming my trolley with calorie-laden goodies, I am pumping the lifeblood back into my son. Meanwhile, Ben trails behind me with one of his I don't know why you're bothering looks. No way will I eat any of this. And of course he doesn't. But hopefully, at our next camp session, I will be shown how to roll out the eating plan successfully. That's the end of chapter 11. If you watch to the end of this video, you'll find an in-video link, which will take you to chapter 12, which is called The Eating Plan. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you for watching. It would also be really good if you could like this video and you can subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button below. Oh, and don't forget to visit my blog you'll find the link below. You'll also find a link to my website where you can download PDFs of my blog for free.